Hi everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Josh Wright Piano TV. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to go over a concept which we actually have not covered much on this channel, which is metronome use. This video is dedicated to one of our pro practice members, Grace, who asked if I could make a video on general tips for using the metronome, how often should I be using the metronome, what do you do in your practice? And I guess the reason we've never covered it in the last 10 or 15 years on this channel is because every teacher has a different philosophy about how much their students should use the metronome. A lot of teachers love it. They say use the metronome all the time and other teachers are so against it. They're almost like allergic to it. They, they're like, don't use the metronome. I understand that second camp, um, their goal in not having their students use the metronome usually because the student solely focuses on that metronome click and they forget everything else. They forget to do their voicing and their shaping and they don't put any rubato in uh, when they're not using metronome because they're so used to that beat. But I think that we can kind of come towards the middle. Uh, I'd like to go over a few examples today to show you some uses of the metronome and how I would apply them and how I would apply them in different styles of music. We'll go over just a basic technique uh, run through with some scales, how I might use the metronome with those. We'll go over a little minuet by Purcell. We will go over a Chopin scherzo, number two. I recently performed that, and there's some things we could talk about in there. And then I'll also review a Chopin mazurka, a very free piece. How would we use metronome in that? I'll give you the different thoughts that I have about when and how often I would use the metronome in these different situations because there isn't just one size fits all, like you should be using metronome 20% of your practice time. It really depends on the case um, and also the level of the student. I might have a little heavier use earlier on in the studies to really establish a good beat. I've had some students who have such poor sense of beat or poor rhythm that I make them do a lot more. And others are very natural at keeping a steady beat and also very intuitive with their sense of rubato that I have them do less. So it all depends on the student, the level, and the situation that you find yourself in. So let's dive in. We'll just start out with a scale, okay? We've gone over this method in other videos before, but I like to call this the one, two, three, four method. And you can fast forward if you already know this, but we'll just do a metronome marking of 100. By the way, I like this app called Metro Timer. You can quickly slide and you can also tap your beat. So if you know your piece is about that tempo, you can tap it out and you don't have to sit and endlessly search for the metronome marking. You can get an approximation, then adjust it. We'll just go to 100. I find that um, students getting to 60, 80, 100, 120, and then around 144. The reason I choose 144 is that was a requirement in one of my university classes, uh, keyboard skills that you had to, if you wanted to test out of the class, which I did, you have to play all your scales at 144. So um, you have to get them at least to 144 if you're a serious pianist. I think that's arbitrary, um, ambiguous <laughs> advice. But um, here we go, 100. So we'll do one octave, one note per click. So this is just review. A lot of you have seen this before, but here we go. You can take a moment to reset if you need, or you can go right into it. Like two octaves, two notes per click. Three octaves, three notes per click. Four octaves, four notes per click. I'm focusing on keeping a nice even touch throughout there. I'm not gonna beat it with the metronome. A lot of students, when they overuse metronome, they might start going. Avoid that. Avoid head bobbing of all sorts. Um, <laughs> I've seen in videos that I, I can't remember who it was, so I won't name any names um, of who I think it might have been, but I thought this was so funny. He's like, you're allowed to go, no, 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 in piano, but he's like, never can we do yes, 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 because this makes our playing vertical. No is kind of this silly way of, you know, I'm playing this gorgeous. 
a mazurka. So I'm getting off topic, but avoid beating your head down with the metronome. That's a really fun way. Another method, I actually hadn't planned on doing this, but let's just do it. If you're trying to, let's say that you're at 100 and you want to get to 110, you know, and you're, you can kind of do some things at 110. This is called the pier, P-I-E-R, note method. making sure you keep the right fingering, but you go click, click, stop, and then you're gonna replay the note that you just stopped on. I have a whole video explaining that. One of my students, Mitchell, actually showed me that many years ago, and I've given it to a lot of students, and that has helped a lot of students break through speed barriers. So that's another little hack that you can use in your technique. You can use um, that same concept with arpeggios. Uh, you may not be doing quite that many notes per peer, but that should help. So that's our first example, scales how I might use the metronome. And I'm going to have the student turn the metronome off at least once a day. If they are struggling with rhythm, I'll have them keep it on almost always. But then I always say, turn the metronome off at the end of the day and really focus on keeping that even beat. Students often use this as a crutch to stay even. You don't want it to become a crutch. It's a tool to help you become more even and develop a natural sense of uh, steadiness and an internal beat, but this can't be the crutch that you rely on at all times. So always, even if you're a brand new beginner, turn that off at the end of your practice session and try it without. Maybe even record yourself, and then maybe kind of beat the metronome on with your uh, beat the metronome with your recording as it's playing, and just see about how much you fluctuate. Music is a natural, living, organic, breathing thing. It is not. Even Bach's music, which a lot of people say should be metronomic. No, it shouldn't. I mean, it should be close, but it should not be metronomic. And I'll probably offend a lot of people by saying that because it's a living, breathing organism. If you take, this is a dangerous example because people have their qualms with pedal as well. Time, see, I have a little time on that. And then maybe not so much time. There aren't many instances in music where it should be 100% metronomic. I do think scalar work can be metronomic, so take it for what it's worth. Next example, Purcell Minuet in A minor. Okay, we'll just take the first two lines. I have a whole tutorial on this in pro practice, um, in the pro practice library. If we wanted to work metronome to check things after we've learned it or if we're learning it and we want to just establish a nice steady beat let's take a little under tempo ya da 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 dum bum 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 so we are about uh, oh wow that was exactly 100 okay so here we go i'm doing terrible fingering the left hand sorry about that I, so that's why i touched the pedal so i wouldn't use much pedal in here Okay, and then if we're wanting to increase, let's say we want to get it to ya da 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 dum bim bum bum da 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 dum bum, one forty five. Okay, if we want to get from a hundred to one forty five. We can do a few things. My teacher, Susan Duelmeyer, who I still go see a few times a year for a lesson, she's just so brilliant. She had me do four uh, in intervals of going up four. So I do 100, 104, 108, 112. I think that's a nice interval. You could do five. Um, it's not that much different. I do notice doing four seems to help if some, uh, because it's a little smaller of an interval. So by the time you get to 20, like 100 to 120, you will have done one more iteration than if you'd gone by fives. Um, if, if the passage is really tough, you can just go up by two metronome markings at a time. One of the other aversions teachers have to metronome is it's a huge time suck if you're doing stuff like this, like 100, 102, 104, 100. But my response to that would be 
only advise the student to do that when needed. And when students are trying to break through speed barriers or develop a bit more natural sense of rhythm, I think that's a valuable use of time. I sure benefited from that when I was younger. Additionally, let's say that you have a goal. A lot of stuff's just coming to my mind here, so this is a little getting a little um, random. But let's say that you have a speed goal of 145. It might be beneficial to go up to 155. And do it there so that you can relax when you go down to 145. It'll feel easier. Okay? So that's a method that I'll sometimes use in really fast works. I go a little beyond it. A lot of students are like, well, if that's a good thing, more is better. No, more is not better because once you start getting so fast, it will get sloppier. So you have to be very intentional if you use that method not to let things get sloppy. Be very careful. Okay, next example was the Chopin Scherzo. This is an example how you can use two different metronome markings on the same passage and how both could provide benefit. So this is in 3-4 time, scherzo number two by Chopin. So it's one, two, three, 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 Pretty intense, monotonous almost to count those all out, but very beneficial. Because of that, I always like to imitate that on metronome. And I might do those three beats, one, two, three, one, two, three, in a slightly slower tempo. So one, two, three, one, two, three. That's about around um, 200 here. So let's see. One, two, three, one, two, three. One. This is 196. One two three 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 very important for the student to do some foundational work like that. Then as you increase the tempo, I mean we could go all the way to two fifty, I'm sure. One two three one one two three one two three one still under tempo. So at that point, I might say, okay, now not only does the metronome on this one max out at 250, I know other metronomes can go faster, um, but now I want to start feeling the main beats, uh, one beat per measure. So, so we'll tap that, two, three, four. So that's 104. You could essentially triple that, so that would be 312 would have been <laughs> for the, each beat. So because it was three beats per measure, now we're doing one beat per measure. Um, so if one beat per measure is 104, three beats per measure would have been 312. If you just do some quick math, just timesing that by three. Hopefully that's right. It's been a lot, while since I did a math class. Here we go. So one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One. The danger of that is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You could totally fudge that one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and kind of fake it. That's why I like some foundational work of a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, so I can feel that oppy. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But then overall, you need to start feeling the piece in larger uh, phrases. Uh, I remember Boris Lutsky had this brilliant idea. He said one and two and three and four and one and two and one and two and one and two and sorry, <laughs> I got off. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and brilliant concept because if you count one and two and three and four and 
one is one measure, and is the next measure, two is the next measure, and is the next measure. You never get off with your counting. You might think, hmm, did I do all those measures of rest? If you do that, he also said the same thing on scherzo three. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and to take a little faster there. So that gives you an idea of um, cleverness with counting, along with marrying this idea of using metronome for smaller beats and then bigger beats. The last example I wanted to give is this beautiful Chopin mazurka. I played this a few years ago. I'm mostly sight reading right now, but... I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous music. You might think metronome has no place in this. And I would say it has no place 98% of the time, 99% of the time. But... And for the faster impulses, you may want to increase that just to feel it. So let's maybe go. Mazurkas are one of the most extreme examples. Nocturnes, you could get by with a little bit more evenness. Why would I ever use that? This is the last concept I wanted to focus on in this piece. As you are developing your sense of rubato, if you're listening to recordings by Sergei Babayan, my favorite pianist, um, or others like Courtois or Ignaz Friedman, um, those with very loose sense of rubato, you can get out into no man's land, and you might be thinking, hmm, I think this sounds good, but you might be doing weird things like... That's really crappy rubato. It's too random. It has to ebb and flow. Now, rubato is sub subjective, but that one was bad because it was choppy. It suddenly sped up and then suddenly slowed down, and there wasn't any rounding, so... Round. It can quickly get get faster, but it can't suddenly get faster. So take time there. Okay. So why would metronome have any place in a piece like this? It brings you back to baseline. It brings you back to reality. You say, wipe all that rubato away. What does it sound like? Then you turn it off and you put the magic back in, but you just felt what baseline is. So more often than not, students don't go from baseline to craziness all in one step. They poison themselves by degrees over the course of the week or two weeks between when I see them. And then they've got overall a good sense of rubato with some real weird stuff. If they had just done this maybe every three or four days or even once a week, for just a few times through the piece or even through a small section, they would have felt, okay, I, I feel this. This is really weird. I remember my favorite example of this is something I did that was really dumb. I remember playing Schumann Sonata. Really gorgeous piece. Uh, you should listen to Argerich's recording if you have not heard that. I love that recording. And um, she <laughs> plays like the wind. I couldn't play like her. But um, 
I remember I was at Michigan with my teacher, Logan Skelton, and he let me get away with a lot of uh, tempo fluctuations. And I came back to Utah and I played for Susan while I was here, like over a summer break or something. And she's like, oh, this is good, but do you know that you're drastically increasing this, these two lines? And I thought, oh, I, I don't think I'm going that fast. And sure enough, we turned on the metronome and it was like 20 notches faster. I was like, how is this possible? I had no idea. So you can poison yourself by degrees. So if you, if I had listened to my own advice that I'm giving you guys in this video and just taken the time to go back once a week and do that, I would have understood, okay, I can maybe take a slightly faster tempo um, beforehand uh, to start the piece before going into this section and rushing like crazy. So it's always a good idea to come back to baseline every once in a while, um, even if your piece is full of rubato and full of spontaneity. Don't live with the metronome on a piece like this. It's actually going to be way more detrimental than useful, but every once in a while, come back to baseline. I hope these four examples have really helped um, to give you some clarity. These are just my opinions. Other teachers have other opinions about metronome use. But I hope that you've um, found some information useful. If you wouldn't mind subscribing and liking this video, it helps the channel out a lot. I really appreciate that. I will go ahead and leave a few links in the description below. One of them is for a free webinar containing 10 of my favorite tips to help take your playing to a higher level. If you haven't already checked that out, I'd highly recommend it. These are tips I use every single day in my practicing and teaching. I'll also, also leave a few links for my paid courses. If you'd like to go even deeper, then this channel goes over. And finally, I will leave a link for my gear kit, all the gear I use to record in my studio in case you're looking for a similar setup. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions.